Well, greetings, everybody. We are very excited to welcome you all to the Reimagine Innovation Session, Employee Engagement in Times of Great Change, hosted by Castellini. My name is Amanda, and I'm Vice President of Education and Program Management here at United Fresh. Now, before we kick things off, I have a few session logistics to review that you probably are all very intimately familiar with as we've been on Zoom for the past year. So as you can see, we're in Zoom meeting and you have the ability to turn on and off your camera as well as mute and unmute yourselves. We love to see your faces, so feel free to keep those cameras on, but your mic's on mute so that we don't have any background noise uh, during the presentation. We will be unmuting our mics once we go into those breakout rooms. We do welcome questions throughout this presentation, so please feel free to type them into the chat pod and we will actually ask them throughout Bonnie's presentation. And then lastly, as you can see, this session is being recorded. So now I would like to turn things over to our keynote speaker today, Bonnie Curtis, Chief Human Resource Officer for Castellini. Hey Bonnie, the floor is yours. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about I think a really hot topic this year, which is engagement, not specific to the produce industry, to all of us, but because we have been um, essential businesses through the last year of COVID, keeping our employees engaged, keeping them with us, um, driving retention is really important. And this is a huge passion of mine. Whether you are a privately held um, small business with a handful of employees or a giant conglomerate with sites all over the United States, I believe there's something here for you. And what I'll be talking through are 10 things that I know work to drive employee engagement because I've done them, because I've read about them, I've tried them, and hopefully there's something here that you will see as well that's useful for you. We're gonna have a breakout at the end, but if you do have questions, yeah, go ahead and um, put them in the chat and, and interrupt me and we'll go from there. So what a year this has been, right? Um, huge change besides the pandemic. We've had staffing issues, I'm sure you have too, trying to get staff, trying to keep staff. We've had social unrest throughout the year, which just adds more stress onto people that are already worried about their health and their families. And then probably all of us are out trying to get new business. Partnership for a Healthy America is one that we're doing right now. And so all of the change that comes with the new business. So it has really been a year of change. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about is here, statistically two thirds of all change efforts fail. And it's not because we couldn't get the funding or we didn't have a good idea, it was because we had poor execution. And this is across global. Um, the way that we have good execution is we keep our employees engaged. So that's the tie to having successful change, whatever it is, and engagement. Let me start by saying what engagement is not. It is not satisfaction, it is not happiness, and it is not contentment. If you are doing satisfaction surveys, I would suggest you get rid of them and go to engagement surveys. I can be a very satisfied employee by coming in, having a cup of coffee, chatting, getting online and buying some new shoes, doing a bit of email, and then figuring out what I'm gonna do for lunch. You get it. I'm getting paid well, and when I get a satisfaction survey, I fill it out. I'm really happy, but I'm not doing the business any good at all. So what we want is people to come in and give us their minds, hearts, and souls while they're at work and be engaged. And that's these are the elements that I'm going to be talking about. Before I start on what the things are, I just have one slide on kind of the science behind this. Gallup is a huge organization. You've probably heard of them. They poll lots of things every year. This past year, they polled over 2 million people, so 276 organizations, and asked about engagement. And they correlated employee engagement to 11 business outcomes. Now, again, this was a global survey, all industries, all size businesses. These 11 business outcomes included customer service, quality, retention, profitability, there are things you care about in your business and engagement correlated to all of them. So if we have engaged employees, you could guess that we're probably also doing other things, but it, it, it will help our bottom line and the results we're trying to achieve. So now I'm gonna go through these 10 things um, about what drives engagement. And the first thing is you as the leader need to totally believe what you're about to go do. Because if you have any doubt 
you can't fake it. People will see that and it will show up to the organization like the flavor of the month. And if we just wait this thing out, it'll go away. And when we're trying to make big change and need engagement, we have to have people believing that we believe in it. This applies to you and it applies to all of the leaders in your organization because they're enabling the workforce to get the work done. So ways to get belief, talk to people inside, outside the industry, find out who, who else did this? Who didn't do this? Did they go broke because they didn't do this? Read about it. There's lots of industry magazines, scholarly journals, whatever you need to read about what you're about to go do attend webinars like this. So I think the very first step to drive employee engagement is total belief that what we're doing is the right thing to do. The second thing is about your personal leadership. So I'm gonna describe three different kinds of leadership to you. We're gonna do a quick poll and see where you think you fall. Um, the first one's transformational. This is a good leadership style during change. These leaders are about change. They're consistent. We hope they're ethical. So charismatic leaders are transformational leaders and we've all known them that can be very ethical or can take you down a very dark path. So we want transformational leaders to be ethical. They tend to be creative, visionary, and they tend to work very personally with people. So that's the first style. The second style is called transactional. This is where probably 80% of leaders are transactional. And this is, um, I'm gonna tell you what I need you to do. We're gonna set measures, goals, smart goals, however you wanna call it. And then when you do it, I'll reward you. I'll give you a raise, I'll give you a bonus, I'll give you a promotion. Or the second line, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I'm just gonna let you do your job. And when you do something wrong, I'm gonna come punish you. So those are transactional traits. Again, most people are transactional leaders. And then the last one, hopefully none of you are this. Hopefully none of you have worked with somebody like this. I have. These are laissez-faire leaders. They don't do anything. They sit in their office. They avoid making decisions. They don't like confrontation. And if anything, they will hurt the change rather than help it. So these are the three main kinds of you know, leadership traits. What I'd like to do now is have Amanda start a poll and see where you feel like you spend most of your time. Which of these styles do you think you do most of the time? And answers coming in, Bonnie. We all see where we ended up on the totals. Yeah. I'll let you know above the 80. So everybody's probably thinking through this. Yeah, I can, yeah. So again, it's transformational, which um, is, is actually good during change. It's visionary, it's um, ethical. Of course, we hope everybody's ethical. Transactional, which is more, I'm gonna tell you what I need you to do, and then I'll reward you or punish you when you do it. And then laissez-faire, which hopefully none of you click that box. Um, of, I'm, I'm just gonna let this thing go by itself. There you go, we've got the results up. Perfect, okay, good. So, like I said, typically um, most people are transactional. So this group is, is more transformational than that. During change, you definitely need transformational leaders. So if you view yourself as a more transactional person, hold on, there's good stuff for you too, but you need to have transformational leaders with you because they're the ones who are gonna create the vision and drive the change. So if you're not one of those people, figure out who they are in your organization and partner with them. If you're transformational, you need a bit of transaction because during change, it's really confusing for people. Everything's changing. They don't know what to do. What worked before isn't working now. And they need some stability. And the transactional leader can give them that stability, which is, I'm going to tell you what I need you to do, whether it's in a daily huddle meeting in the morning, whether it's every 90 days, whether it's once a year. But here's what I need you to do. Let's be really clear and I'll reward you if you do it. And there's some stability in that. So what you really want is a little bit of both. And what I would encourage you to do is if you fall on any one of these is to try to practice a little bit of the other because the more, um, the more you have in your toolbox to demonstrate leadership, again, you don't wanna be flipping all over the place every day, but there's times when each one of these works and you wanna be able to switch between them. Thank you, Amanda. So, 
The next one is lead people through the change. And again, this is the job as a leader. So there's steps here. Before you even start, we've got to sell the problem. So when we have people who've been working for 30 years doing things the same way, and it's really worked well for them and the company, to go to them now and say, "Uh uh-uh, that's not going to work anymore, is going to be met with resistance. And we have to understand that and sell people why it isn't going to work anymore, why the environment's changing, what's changing. I just don't know how to... Um, we need to share the vision. Here's where we're trying to go and share it over and over. While we're doing this, we need to be very trustworthy. So if we go in and tell people, if we don't fix this in six months, we're out of business and that's not true, people will know that. And then the trust is gone for the rest of the change. And in order to keep people engaged, we have to tell them the truth and we have to be trustworthy. So that all happens hopefully before you even start the change. The first step of the change is actually called the ending. So this is where all the things we knew are going away, right? We have to talk about what we have to let go of. We have to conduct symbolic actions that that part's over and we're moving forward. This is metaphorically burning the ships. We're not gonna burn the ships, but if we're installing a new computer system and the paper's gone, we announce the day that happens and we give everybody free ice cream and we say, okay, guys, this is it, we're going. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but it was a symbolic, today's the day we're making this change. Then you get into the hard part, which is the neutral zone. And this picture comes in my head every time I'm leading change. So let me describe this for you and maybe it will for you in the future. Imagine you're standing way up in the air on a two by two platform, clutching onto this, um, this bar, and your boss, coach, whoever it is, is standing behind you saying, I'm going to push you now. And when you get out to the middle, that other bar is coming at you. And when you see it, let go of this bar and grab that one and you'll be fine. If you don't see that other bar coming at you, you will never let go of the bar. And as leaders, we have to help that happen. Um, I'll give you an example. Many, many years ago, we were enacting a change where we were trying to get the line operators to do more maintenance themselves and not keep calling the mechanics out and give the mechanics other work to do. So we told everybody we were gonna do this and we told the mechanics, your job is to start, you know, let's start easy. How do you adjust photo eyes and what, what, what to drive these changes? And the mechanics wouldn't do it. They stalled, they complained. They said these people weren't smart enough. I mean, every excuse in the world. They were holding onto the bar because they didn't know what they were going to be doing when this was over. I think they thought we were going to get rid of them. So we sat them all down and said, look, if you can pass some of this work to them, you can meet with vendors, you can meet with the engineers, you can work on installing new stuff. And they were like, oh, okay. And then they started. So when you're meeting resistance to change from people, a lot of the time it's this, they don't know what's in it for me. Why should I do this? Until we can paint that picture, it's very hard. And then we get into the new beginnings. We've moved. Now we need to be flexible and patient. People are trying. We need to reward new behaviors, et cetera. This is a complicated thing because we're going to have people that are hunkering down saying, I've done it this way for 30 years. I'm not changing. All the way to, come on, let's go. This is going to be fun. And you're going to be dealing with all those people as you go through. And people may move. They may be, okay, this is fun. And then when they get the new computer program, they go, oh my goodness, this is harder than I thought. And then they get scared and start hunkering down again. So leading people through all of this um, takes effort. And we need to do this if we're going to keep them engaged and, and stop them from leaving. This one I've learned the hard way to communicate to your blue in the face. Like I told you once, I told you twice, I've told you three times, how many times do I have to tell you? Seven. I mean, the data shows we have to explain things in different ways to people seven times before they will change their mind about something. And some people never will. But this includes having meetings, having daily huddles, putting things on TV screens, putting things in newspapers, having lunches, whatever it takes when we're enacting a big change and we want to keep the people moving through it with us and not leave them behind, it takes a lot of communication. Um, And we need to plan on who's doing it how often they're doing it and when they're doing it. Because we've been thinking about this a long time and they haven't. So we need to help bring bring people along. This is one of my favorite ones, which is do with, don't do to or do for. And this is basically treat people like adults. 
I'll give you a couple examples. One's an HR example. Say you get a new payroll system and people are now supposed to use their phones to figure out how much vacation they have left and what they got in their paycheck that got deposited in the bank account. So we do all this training of the whole workforce. Do four looks like I'm treating you like a child. So I know that you don't like using your phone for this. So I'm gonna go ahead and print your paycheck every week for you anyway, put it in an envelope and stick it somewhere for you so you don't ever have to deal with this. That's doing things for. Doing things too is saying, when you come in, I can't make this work, is look, we did training, you attended the training, you have a password, go figure it out. That's do too. Obviously do with is come in, let's do a little bit more training and let's figure out how to do this. Here's a harder example. Let's say you get a new customer and because of the timing of when the trucks are leaving and stuff, half the crew now needs to come in two hours earlier. I'm assuming you don't have a union. In my shop, it would be very easy to figure out how to do this, but let's assume you don't have a union. So do two is let's make this easy on me. I'm gonna take the least senior people and put them on the early shift. I'm gonna do this alphabetically. I'm gonna just do this to you. I don't care, I don't need your opinion. Do four is where I sit down without any input from you and try to figure out, okay, this one has childcare problems and that one carpools, so I'm gonna go ahead and set this all up. I'm gonna do it for you. Do with, which is harder, but drives engagement is get the whole crew together and say, look, half of you need to come in two hours earlier. I'm gonna let you sort of try to figure out if you're gonna rotate this or how you're gonna do it. I'm gonna give you this much time to figure it out. And if you can't, I'm making the decision and here's what we're gonna do. That's doing with. It takes a little longer. You have to trust in people that they're adults and they'll figure it out. But in the end, you've got a lot more engagement because they own the solution. The next one's meaningful work. Um, there's a lot of work that we do that is probably not highly aspirational, but I really believe we can find meaning in any work. And an important thing about meaningful work is it allows people to behave in ways that fit their own self-image of who they are. So if I believe that I'm a helper and I help people and that's who I am, meaningful work for me is I get to be the trainer of the new people when they come in. I get to tour the customers when they come because I'm helping. Anything to do with help, put me on that because that just reinforces my belief about who I am. If I believe I'm the smartest one in the room and I learn fast, letting me train people is not gonna make me feel good. I'm just gonna get super frustrated. So make me the key user on the new system. Let me help install whatever the new thing is. I get to be smart, I get to learn, that's what turns me on. The only way this works though, is if I know my people and I build purpose into their work. So again, it takes a bit of effort to create engagement, but I really believe, I mean, we have done a lot of work here assigning things around. So one person's in charge of the CPR program. And these aren't like leaders as you would think of leaders. One guy's helping us plan the whole new reinvented picnic that may or may not happen based on COVID, but huge change in what we've ever done before. Um, we are trying to get people involved in things that they wouldn't have been involved in before based on their interest. And that keeps people coming to work. And next time somebody sticks a sign in the grass and says they're hiring at $3 an hour more than you're paying, they're less likely to go because they're coming for something else. This has been a tough year for energy and stress. And I think if we wanna keep people engaged, I know this, we have to manage energy and regulate stress. And we've done a lot of work here on that, staying in touch with people, hiring temps to help people out so we're not forcing people to work weekends, um, teaching managers new skills so they can share the workload. Um, we have an employee assistance program, teaching leaders how to recognize stress in their employees before it bubbles over. So. There's a big piece of this that I think exists right now more than I've ever seen. And I believe it's gonna go on because things aren't better yet. So our ability to manage people's stress and energy is going to help us keep them engaged. Delegation is another one of my favorites. So I will do the work that I like doing, that I'm comfortable doing, that I feel really good doing. That's not good. That's probably not what I'm getting paid to do. 
So what I try to think when I come in in the morning now is, am I doing things that only I can do? Because that's how I'm adding value to this organization. And if I'm doing things I can delegate, I'm not doing myself a favor or the company or my direct reports, because if I delegate to them, it's probably challenging work for them. They can learn something new. So I think about this every day. I literally look at my schedule and say, should I be doing all these things I'm doing? And if the answer is yes, go do them. But I need to be doing things about next year and how do we help profitability and what's the environment doing and what are our competitors doing? That's what I ought to be thinking about not coming in here and rope doing what I've always done. The last one on this slide is another really important one, which is offer choice. When we ask people to change, there's usually a lot of resistance if they don't wanna change. And I have found over the years that if we offer them a choice, it changes the conversation completely. So um, if I'm doing pick and pack stuff, and now you've put in a new computer system and I now need to come in and input my own, how many did I do and what time did I finish? And I really don't wanna do that. And I start complaining loudly about that. Then as the boss, you can come to me and say, okay, this job is now requiring this. If you don't wanna do that, that's fine. There's this job over here, it doesn't pay as much. Do you want that? I can move you. Well, now the onus is on me to figure out what I want instead of just complaining. So when I hear a lot of complaining, I always try to figure out what's the choice. Sometimes the choice is leave the company if, if this isn't tenable for you. But as soon as I offer choice, the conversation changes. And I would encourage you to try that. Frontline managers, they are the pillars of any change outfit or any change um, thing you try to do. They're half the management ranks and they manage 80% of the workforce. So if you're trying to change anything and you want your people engaged, you've got to get the frontline managers there because they're the ones, they are the company, right? To most of your people. So how do you engage the frontline managers? First of all, know what they're doing, spend time with them because I used to be a frontline manager and 10 years later I was managing them and I thought I knew what those jobs were and I didn't, I knew what that job was 10 years ago but I didn't know what it was now. So take time to understand what the frontline manager is doing. Listen to them because they're gonna come with difficulties and problems of their own that probably seem trivial, but to them, it's a really big deal. And if you can honor their requests, it shows you care about them. Um, have lunch with the frontline managers once in a while. Go back after this and, you know, pat your frontline managers on the back. Because here's the tie. Success in a change only happens when half of the team leaders buy in and at least 25% go beyond the normal call of duty. That's your frontline managers. They have to be all in this with you so that they can lead this workforce who probably aren't as vested in the change as you and I. Make the tough calls on staffing. It took me a long time to learn this. Um, there's a lot of toxic people in organizations. We all have them. 64% of employees say they've worked with somebody who's toxic. Typically the toxic people are still there because they have a skill that we need or they're really good with the customer or something that we feel like we can't do without. So we overlook their behavior and we coach them and we give them hints and we pat them on the back and say, good job on this, but you really need to work on that. What I have found is eventually, because typically they don't change, and eventually it gets so bad, we need to make a change and let them go. And two things happen when that happens. The first one is the whole organization just calms down. And then I realize how bad it really was. The second thing is that magical skill they had or that thing they did that I didn't think anybody could do. Almost always somebody rises to the occasion and steps in and does it. Sometimes I have to hire from the outside, but usually there's somebody there that's been waiting in the wings that's capable. And then I say to myself, why did I wait so long to do this? So I would encourage you to figure out who those toxic people are in your organization, coach them because of course they deserve that. But then when it's not working, make a move faster than you probably would normally. The last one is get on the balcony. So imagine this dance floor. It looks like this, life of the party, but you've also got two people standing over by the punch bowl talking. You've got what used to be called in my day, wallflowers, people standing by themselves against the wall. But we spend most of our time on the dance floor with them. 
And we can't see all that other stuff that's going on on the periphery. If we as leaders lift ourselves up off the dance floor onto the balcony and look down at it, now we see things. That party, that wild party in the middle, who's the life of that party? Because that person is a leader. Whether they have stripes on their shoulder or not, they're a leader in your organization. And if you're gonna drive change and you want people engaged with the change, that person has got to be with you. What effort are you making to get that person with you? The two people on the, on the punch bowl, what are they doing? They're clearly not in the middle of the party. Are they trying to overthrow you? Are they thinking of better ways to do it? Get them in. The wallflowers, underutilized. What do we need to do to get them active? So clearly we need to spend a lot of our time on the dance floor because that's our job. I mean, stuff happens and we need to get in there. But if we never lift ourselves up to the balcony, we never can see what's going on and find ways to truly engage everybody. So there's the 10 things. Um, actually, no, it's eight things, sorry. Um, first of all, you've got to believe it yourself or, or there's no point even starting it. I would say, you know, most of you showed up as transformational. Use the traits that are transformational and I've listed them here as well as transactional. Lead people through the transition and they're going to go back and forth, back and forth. Communicate while you're doing it. Treat people like adults, do it with them. Pay a particular attention to your frontline managers, make those staffing calls that are tough and get yourself time to get up on the balcony. So what I'd like to do now is break you into breakout groups and there's, there's, they're gonna be reasonably small breakout groups. So I, I think you'll have all a time to talk. You have 10 minutes. What surprised you that I said and what questions do you still have? So Amanda, I'll give it to you, I guess. Yes, you got it. Okay, everybody. So you're going to see a pop up on your screen in one second to go in. We do have a host in every room to help keep the conversation moving, but this is our chance to talk to each other. So let's open up those rooms and head on in. Well, we have everybody coming back into this main room. Welcome back to those that were in conversations. I hope we didn't jolt you out of them too quickly. Um, Bonnie, the floor is yours. Okay, so what I'd like to know are um, any insights you had, anything I said you don't agree with, any thoughts you had, any questions you had. I'm not going to go around the room and make everybody report back, but I'd be interested in any thoughts you have. I would love to call on Zoe um, of our group to ask her question um, to the group. Hi, Bonnie. I'm Zoe. Um, so Hi, Zoe. I'm, an, I'm an HR intern at Calabo Growers, and um, I came up with the question, like, how do you boost employee engagement in a virtual setting? That is a great question, and we've all lived with that. I'll give you one. You have to be creative, right? Um, you have to stay in contact. So when we went virtual, and we were only virtual for like two weeks, we started having daily meetings with all the HR people every morning. And, and there was no real agenda. It was just, we need to touch base every day and talk. And we've come back to work and we're still doing it. We all decided that was a really good thing to do and we're still doing it. So I think enhanced communication. My son actually works for a cannabis company and they're pretty progressive. And he got some award and he's in Ohio, his boss is in Chicago. And they said, we're gonna have a party for you um, and get a few people online and just celebrate. And he's like, oh mom, this is so lame. And then he gets this bottle of really expensive champagne delivered to his house the day of the party and everybody had champagne. So that was a memory he'll always have, right? So I think we have to be, um, I think we have to be genuine. You know, I think getting online and doing fake ropes courses probably isn't what we need. We need genuine conversation. The other thing I try to do is check in with people and see how they're doing. And I did a lot of that in the beginning but like, just take a moment, close your eyes. Let's breathe for 30 seconds. People think that's hokey, but it does get you in the room, calm down. And then let's talk about like, what's a great thing you did today? You know, just pick a topic and let people share. And then it feels more like you're together, I think from an engagement standpoint. I hope that helps, just a few ideas. Good question. Hey Bonnie, this is Julian with United. Hi. So in our breakout session, we had one of our participating participating was Linda, and Linda, I apologize if I mispronounced her last name. I think it was Eskers, um, and she wanted to get your thoughts on what you thought, um, or, or she made a couple comments about how 
corporate culture comes into play. And she wanted to know what your thoughts were on corporate culture and, and how that affects the, the various points that you covered during your presentation. Yeah, you know, I worked for Procter & Gamble for 40 years and they had a very different culture than Castellini. I mean, these two companies couldn't be different, you know, more different other than they're both in the United States. So every corporation you're in, you're, you're starting at a different place, right? Depending on the corporate culture. Um, we didn't used to have daily huddle meetings for all of the employees. And when we start talking communication, communication, it's like they need to know what's going on. They need to know what today's gonna look like. They need to know what visitors are coming, what new business we want. So we started daily huddles. That was not easy, right? Lots of resistance from the managers and everybody. Now we need to hit the floor running. But we did it and every single person in the company, whether you're in sales or in HR or on the production floor, any shift, we now have daily meetings. That was going on at P&G 30 years ago. So, you know, you have to think about what is the communication and I'll just pick an easy one. Are we virtual? Um, how much communication is happening? How am I engaging my employees with communication? So when COVID hit, Brian, who I think is on the call, who's our CEO, said, we've got to start giving people more updates than we have been. And it was COVID and it was, you know, April. The weather was nice here. So we took everybody out to the parking lot, spread everybody socially distant. He literally had a megaphone and he talked to people about what was going on. We said, well, hopefully COVID's over by the winter because we can't have everybody in the parking lot by the winter. Well, guess what? All winter long, we were out in the parking lot and he did it every shift. He started recording it. So people who were still working virtually got it. We gave people free lunch off the food truck. So that was a cool thing. And we've had a lot of feedback from our engagement survey. It's just nice to know what's going on in the other departments. I don't hear about this. So again, that was something we had to start. So, you know, if you have a toxic corporate culture, you need to address that first because you are not going to have engaged people in a toxic culture. You're just not. But if you if you don't have a toxic culture, I think it's it's step by step by step. You know, what do I already have? What do I want to add? What's important? And go step by step. Good, what else? Bonnie, we had a question in our group that we chatted about was, um, how does someone who is not necessarily senior staff um, encourage their managers to adopt that more, like do with leadership style as opposed to a do to sort of, um, you know, directing people as opposed to uh, bring them together? That takes courage. <laughs> and um, it helps if you're in a safe environment where you have a boss you can go to and say, hey, I heard this thing. I think we can do more of this. I'm going to practice it and I'll let you know how it goes, right? Don't ask them to do anything different. Just say, I'm going to practice this. And then when you and I talk, I'll tell you how it's working or how people are feeling about it. Um, but it takes courage. And I, I mean, I've had to, you know, put your courage to the sticking post and go to my boss a couple of times and say, not now, but in, in future <laughs> previous jobs and say, you know, I really think we're making a mistake here. And um, again, I'm going to try this and I'll let you know how it goes. And it's your decision on what you can't make them do anything, right? All you can do is lead by example, but there's a lot of power in that because the people enjoy working for you and then you get a reputation for being a good boss. And then they finally come back and say, well, okay, what are you doing? Right? So start with what you've got. Um, and, and keep the lines of communication open with the boss. And sometimes they change and sometimes they don't. You can't control what they're gonna do. Yeah. Tony, this is Ralph. I'm for, with uh, Four Seasons Produce. Apologize for my video, having some challenges. Um, but the question is, what do you think about a culture team, uh, culture action team of sorts and how that could be leveraged in, in uh, this particular area. And of your eight bullets, um, you know, are there specific areas where you'd say they are particularly helpful here or, or not? So when you say culture teams, what do you mean? Um, so the thought here is that, you know, one, one view is HR drives culture. Another view is you you push culture out to the rest of the organization and and maybe maybe um, the people who are coming up with ideas on how to instill culture are not the executives are actually maybe middle managers and below. So mm -hmm. looking at a culture team like that and then how they could be leveraged to drive retention. So I 
distributed. Yeah, I believe in distributed leadership. If we are counting on people that we designate a title leader on an org chart to do leadership, you're, you're, we're not going to get the job done. So we, we need to empower people, which is again engagement to have leadership at all levels. You know, and if we're willing to listen to people who are doing these jobs every day, they have good ideas too. Um, but if if we keep shutting them down, you have nothing. So back to your point about if you have middle managers that are on a culture team, we actually did that here. When, when I started here, um, actually it was after I started here, it was a couple of years ago, we combined three facilities into one facility and they had very different cultures, very different histories, everything was different. So we created a culture teams of all three of them. Um, and we met for chunks at a time. So this isn't something you're gonna do in a, in a 30 minute lunch. We did like half day meetings, full day meetings. And again, that's difficult to pull people out of the operation. We had people from different functions, different levels. We had a couple of hourly people on this team too that we thought were brave enough to speak up. Um, and we said, where are we with the culture today? Where would we like to be? And why do we need to change? I mean, the first step was getting that group to believe we needed to change. And then what are the elements of culture we wanna look at? So you've got things like, what is the structure? How does information flow? What is the decision-making process? How do we reward people? There's just elements of culture that we need to look at. What are we doing today? And what do we wanna do in the future? Um, against what do I think is the most important thing on that list? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's probably communication. I mean, we've got to start with communication because when people have more information, they tend to be more engaged and they tend to be more willing to give you their thoughts and we need their thoughts. Um, but I think culture teams can be very powerful. I think you have my email. If you want to talk about this more, just reach out to me because, like I said, we did this about a year ago, and it really helped the integration of these, these three companies get together and create really a new culture for the company and one that we wanted to have. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully you all found one thing in here that you can go try um, and see if it's going to work for you. Um, and again, I think you have my email. Um, I will send out this presentation for you. And on the last page are a bunch of references. So that's all the techno stuff. But if you're on the page that I reference at the bottom and then on the last page, if you, if you care about this stuff and want to learn more about it, there's articles you can read. Um, to give you a little bit more information. Okay. So anyway, um, I, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, what do you think about the uh, happiness at work with a base of element to the uh, engagement or maybe to uh, use this with the base to the leadership of fairy date, basic date? Ah. Uh, something like that. Yeah, there's been a lot of studies on happiness at work. And I'll share a little bit. It was fascinating. People who are happy are happy. They're going to be happy no matter what. People who are miserable are miserable. And they've done studies. Like if your happiness is about here and you win the lottery, you're going to do this and come back and be here in a year. If your happiness is about here and you get in an accident and lose a leg, you're going to go here and come back here. So happiness somehow is inherent in us. After I read all these articles, I came back to my HR team and said, only hire happy people. And they, they, they said, are you kidding? We're having a hard time getting people. How can we just hire? How do you even check for that? I said, I don't know. But when you're interviewing them, if they seem miserable, don't hire them. Because happiness breeds happiness at work. If people are happy, it helps the, all those fence sitters become happy. So there is definitely a piece of happiness at work. And it's a mindset. But I don't know how to arrange work for happiness. I know how to arrange work for engagement. And my belief is if we engage people, they're not going to worry so much about whether they're happy or not. And you know, when you're busy on a project at home, you're not thinking, am I happy? You're doing the project. You're having fun doing the project. And that's why I feel that engagement is so important. But happiness research is really interesting. There's a lot of it out there. And it's almost scary. It's almost scary. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Thank There's you. a lot of comments about that thing. Only hire happy people. There's the quote for the for the session, right? <laughs> kind of useless, but good. 
Anything else before we leave? Um, <clears throat> who are some of the thought leaders on engagement in your mind in the industry that you would recommend? Yeah, um, and they're in the references. The, the, the people who've done the most work on this are uh, Bernard Bass, Avolio, Al, 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 and um, uh, Ron Riggio. They have done 30 years of research on engagement. There's actually engagement tests we can take. Um, there's engagement training you can get. Um, but again, what I tried to do in half an hour was tell you all, I'm getting my PhD in leadership. So I'm reading hundreds of articles on all these subjects and I've worked for 40 years. So some of the articles I read, I just write big no in red. I mean, this is academic stuff. It doesn't work, I know that. But a lot of them I'm like, yeah, that does work. And then I try it some more. So what I shared with you is a blend of all the articles and what the leaders are saying in the field and what I've tried. But if you're really interested, I just look up Ron Riggio and he's published a ton of stuff, written books and, uh, and engagement is really his thing, R-I-G-G-I-O. He's a professor at Claremont McKenna in California. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Bonnie, I don't think we have any more questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. This was really fun. And uh, I wish you all luck in your engagement journey. Um, we can't just hire happy people. So we need to hire whoever we can and engage them while they're here. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. And as Bonnie mentioned, we will be sending out a follow-up email with the deck as well as a link to the recording, just in case you missed part of the session today. Uh, we appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you at another United Fresh event in the future.